Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we are changing the mental health narrative, bringing hope and solutions. Here's your host, Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. Since 2003, Jill Tremlett Large has worked with participants in the Women's Independence Scholarship Program, WISP for short. For 25 years, WISP has provided financial support in the form of college scholarships to women who are survivors of intimate partner abuse. The book, Where the Light Gets In, is a collection of stories from program participants about the gift that they received from WISP and about the infinite positive ripple effect of that one action. Well, Jill, welcome. It's great to see you. Thanks. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm excited to have you tell us about your book and how that came about and uh, all of the the juicy stuff you wanted to share about this book, Where the Light Gets In. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, it's actually a project uh, that I was assigned for work. The assignment was, think of something to do to um, celebrate our 25th anniversary of providing scholarships to women who are survivors of intimate partner abuse. And just a little backstory, I work for the Women's Independent Scholarship Program. And um, that was started by Doris Buffett in 1999. So um, it's a momentous occasion. It's a quarter century of helping women complete the education that they choose. Um, So no small task come up with an idea. Um, But that's part of my job. I work with our graduates and I also am in charge of our um, legacy because Doris Buffett passed away in 2020. So um, it did fall within what I am supposed to do. Um, Unfortunately, what ended up happening, the inspiration for the book came from an email who actually is the first story in the book, Linda. Um, sent me this note out of the blue and said that um, she was an early recipient of our scholarship, you know, within the first few years. So for about the last 20 or so years, she thinks about Doris every day and the gift that she received from WISP. And she does everything she can to pass that gift forward to every patient that she works with. She's in the medical field And um, it just struck me that, first of all, that's an incredibly long time to have remembered this scholarship and to think of it daily, and then to pass that forward, you know, that type of goodwill forward and how the the idea of like infinite ripples, um, I, I just got really curious first of all I wanted to know well what would what does she think the gift was because she didn't tell me in the email she just said this gift of wisp and um so I wanted to know what she thought it was and then I also wondered if anybody else had stories like that so that was the idea I decided I would uh, collect these stories and put them in a book um and I had absolutely no idea how to do that. And, uh, but I think also interesting um, was when I proposed this idea to my executive director, she immediately said yes. Um, Very quickly after I decided I was going to do these interviews, I um, sent out an, an ask, you know, for volunteers, and I got a lot of positive response. And in uh, this other group that I'm part of, I co-host a meditation group. Um, One of the members just voluntarily said that she had just written a book where she interviewed students who were in recovery. And I thought, well, I mean, that's exactly what I want to do. So I had a mentor, someone who I could talk to about like, well, how, you know, gave me the framework for it. Um, She put me in touch with an editor. Um... And I say all of these things just to say that this whole project was a series of green lights. There was never a time where I ha- I got a no, really. Um, 
And every time I got to a point where like, I didn't exactly know where to go next or what to do next, something would come across my email or a person would say something or, you know, just the way kept becoming clear. So the challenge for me was to keep saying yes to, you know, this was not only a project for my job, and it was a beautiful collaboration with the storytellers who are featured here. It was also really a personal journey of like looking at some of my fears about being visible myself. You know, I was really uncomfortable with my name being on this book. Didn't I don't like having my name right on the cover. Um, because... I think I, I just felt very visible, you know, I, I felt, and it's, they're not even my stories too. Um, but it was like almost too much exposure, um, in a way, like I kind of, I prefer to kind of be in the background. I don't like being the center. I'm, I like getting like sweaty right now talking about it, <laughs> but, um, you know, I had to keep going back to if this was not supposed to be, it would have been halted in some place. Um, so I'm going to continue with the energy and the momentum because this message is very important to me too. You know, I, I want this message to be out in the world. And if I am the person who's going to be the voice of the message, well, who am I to keep my mouth shut? Who am I to let my, you know, fears or my, my desire to stay small, um, keep me quiet that that's not okay so what what makes this such a powerful topic for you oh uh, well i think that um that's a good question i think there's a there's several things i think i'll start with the the author bio um and in it i have one line um where i say that i experienced my own painful time when I became a mother and a widow in a space of 10 days. And I think that gives me a unique way to connect with other people who have seen really difficult times and have used that pain to fuel their purpose. And that to me is a, just an incredibly important message to come to give across because I thought that I was broken when everything fell apart and I had so much difficulty and had to, you know, walk through pain for days and years. Um, and I thought there was something wrong with me, but now that I've come through that, um, and it's always with you, but I've, I've come through a lot of the really intense times and I realized it actually made me better. And, um, I think each of the stories in this book also are, that same way each storyteller had her own particular set of circumstances and has come through on the other side with a gift and they're sharing it now um and that's you know that goes back to in the introduction i talk a little bit about kintsugi that japanese art of repairing something broken with the gold and i woke up one morning thinking about human kintsugi and i knew that had to go in the book because you know, I felt broken, but I do think that I fixed those broken pieces with gold. And, and because I was broken, it's now more beautiful. It's elevated. And I think um, that's why I'm passionate about this. Um, that's why it's so important to me. And I also really truly believe that it's not such a sweeping grandiose gesture that's necessary to change the world. I think that each individual person has the power to change the world simply by using their unique gifts. And I also think that this book is a great example of that. Doris Buffett herself um, started this scholarship and her all of her philanthropy was driven by places in her life that were painful. And she identified with people who needed a hand up and she wanted to not, it's not charity. She just understood that not everybody had equal chances in life. And she wanted to level the playing field. 
Um, and again, each storyteller in the book, very similar. Um, so that's why I think, well, I know that I kind of had to get out of my own way. You know, I have to face these fears, these voices that tell me, oh, be quiet, don't, don't talk. Like they're still there, um, but this is more important. Well, and I, I love the way the individual stories for anybody who's got the eyes to see are, are these stories of strength and accomplishment. And, um, and so, you know, I don't know what kind of a screening uh, mechanism you have, but it seems like um, Adam Grant wrote a book, um, Givers, uh, Give and Take is the title of his book. And he talks about how um, there are people who are takers and people who are givers and people who are matchers. And his theory was, uh, you know, I bet that the lower 25% of the socioeconomic scale, all the down here in poverty, is overloaded with people who are givers and they've just mm -hmm. given away all their money and that's why they're poor. So he did some research to figure out, you know, how to, to create the assessment device. Are you a giver, a taker, or a matcher? And and administered it to people at both ends of the spectrum and all through the middle. And he was right. There are more givers in the lower 25 percentile of socioeconomic status in our country. But there are also more givers in the upper 25 percent. Hmm. So how does that happen? And what are the differences between the people at the high end versus the low end when they're all when they're both givers? And what he discovered in his research, because he got hungry about that question, mm -hmm. let's sort sort this out. What he found is by interviewing people that there are some significant differences. And people in the higher quadrant of socioeconomic level who identify as givers they do certain things like they make sure that they and their family have plenty first, and then they give mm -hmm. from their surplus. Mm -hmm. They balance their energies. They don't just go all in in one thing. And they have a tendency to screen to make sure that they're not giving too much to people who are takers or just matchers. They give more to other givers. So this ripple effect you mentioned before is amplified. And it strikes me that either you've been really lucky or you've got some good screening in, in these stories because these are people who are using what they've been given and using it as a blessing for themselves and others. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's probably, uh, I feel like there is a, a fair amount of luck or good fortune or, or something that we sort of happens in in everything that we tend to do and when i say we i mean the women's independent scholarship program i mean we do screen um and and for this book in particular i did send out um email to all of our graduates and it is interesting to me that the people who stepped forward to share their stories did have that commonality that they all took their pain and turned it into their purpose really or they're using it as fuel for doing something good in the world um, and I would suspect that there's probably a lot more who maybe didn't get the email or are doing that I I'm willing to bet um, I feel like did I lose you no or do you still have, okay we're here um yeah I I also wanted to say that, so our scholarship is um, need-based. So we are um, choosing people who have, you know, little to no education. We do not look at their um, educational background. If they've gone to college before, they don't need a particular GPA. It's not merit-based, you know, they don't have to have a ton of amazing qualifications. Um, and they, they, they really rise to the top. Um, we have very minimal requirements to continue with our program. For example, we have a GPA requirement. It's a 2.75, which is, I think, a C plus. Um, and it's really more to make sure that they're actually passing classes and 
eventually will complete their degree. Uh, but we have so many people who just are high achievers. And I think some of it w can be attributed to the fact that um, someone who didn't know them believed in them enough to invest in their education. And, you know, I can guess at that, but also, um, I mean, it's been said right. time and time it. again. Yeah. Yeah, that, that there is so much about our interactions in community and the expectations we hold for ourselves. And it's just such a powerful set of dynamics that is often not even recognized, but it's still active. Very much so. And, and again, this was also something we sort of did accidentally is building that community um, way back before we understood how important community is just for people in general, you know, all of this research and about ACEs and trauma and how we're wired for connection, like that now validates what we've been doing all along. Um, but we do very intentionally create a community um, of caring. I, and I said something, I said to someone recently, Doris Buffett's legacy, I think it can be summed up in two words, which are caring deeply. And she really cared very much about every single one of our scholarship recipients. And that comes through in everything that we do, even now. I will say, uh, you know, one of our requirements when someone gets a scholarship is they have to send a thank you note. There's, and there's a section in the book called thank you. And it explains why. Um, but Doris would read them and she would comment on them. And she would sometimes call us up and ask them questions, ask us questions about that particular person. Um, so she was heavily personally invested in each person's success. And um, what I recently realized is that for survivors of intimate partner abuse, that connection is even more healing because abuse is isolating on purpose. You know, the yeah. abuser purposely cuts off connection with friends and family and the outside community on and on. And so to, for someone who, to, to come back into community um, can be a little scary. It can be very weird. Um, sometimes they forget how to interact with people. Oh yeah. And so um, yeah. to offer whole learning. A, yes, yes. It's it's relearning. It's healing. It's like the antidote to all the negative things they've been told. Um, so so that's an extra layer of why community and connection is so important for the women that we work with, and um, you know probably for all of us. Well, I think about so. Oh, you just got muted, Dr. Tim. There are so many things I think about while I'm reading the book. One of them is a couple different charity organizations that I've been involved with over the years have had a focus on let's not just throw money Mm -hmm. at the problem let's make sure that we're doing something that empowers the people who receive this and one of the stories uh well there's a, a few of them in your book but that highlight how valuable it is to have a team like yours offering money to people in that situation is that they understand so many of the dynamics mm -hmm. of a person who's working with her trying to get out of intimate partner abuse for instance the story where the woman got the money for the car and and the note came to her and said do not repair your partner's car go get a car in your own name and the the volume that speaks about the understanding of the levels of control and the need for autonomy and the the different um you know, kind of strings that can get pulled by an abuser in those situations, that it enlightens the people. It, it it's you're sharing at such a an important level because you understand the dynamics, and you're offering people not just some money but some guidance for how to get out of their situation into something better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a a powerful uh, story 
and I, I, that's Kristen's story. Um, and at the time she still had that car. I mean, it was years later, um, but she really just felt like they get it. Right. Somebody sees me. Yes, exactly. And I think that's another important point to these stories is being seen. There's a couple of women who mentioned that they were so happy to have the opportunity to tell their story in their own way um, rather than someone else taking their story, you know, like in the court system. Um, one of them in particular, you know, got cast as a, um, you know, a forever student just going to school so she didn't have to get a job. And, you know, these negative um, judgments but she got to, to tell her story the way it was true for her. And, you know, I think being seen in, in the way you want to be seen is really important rather than having these labels just placed upon you. Um, and then, you know, I mean, even talking about it, I kind of feel like the heaviness of these labels and just having to carry um, the shame that comes along with them and to be able to, throw that off. And no, I'm not taking what you call me. That's not what I am. How many, if you have the number at hand, how many people in the 25 years have received scholarships? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, it's high up in the thousands. Um, I don't want to say a number that's wrong and be verbally, um, but it's, it was a, uh, a surprisingly high number. And it's that's an interesting question too, because we could talk about individual people that we've helped or a number of scholarships because each person might get quite a few scholarships if she starts with us to do an associate's degree and then completes her bachelor's. So that could be six years worth of scholarships too. So um Number of scholarships high in the thousands. I I could say probably we might have gone over three thousand individuals um, now that have received have completed their degrees or gotten scholarships from us. Is it uh, geographically centered in one area of the country or another? It's national. And how do people find out about this program? I think there's a, there's several ways. The internet helped us a lot. Um, of course, when I started back in 2003, the internet was not a big thing. Um, we, I think early, like in the very beginning, Doris and the people that were working on this scholarship initially um, marketed through state coalitions for domestic violence. So it was really reliant on mailing direct mail and word of mouth. Um, now, you know, people who are going to school and searching scholarship databases can find us. Um, they might search scholarships for women. Um, I'm not even sure. I do think maybe some people search scholarships for domestic violence survivors, and I don't think there's a whole lot out there other than us. Um, two of the storytellers one of them found us in a book, you know, there used to be these giant books of, of scholarships that yeah, would be updated yeah. as soon as, yeah, as soon as they got printed, she found us in there. Um, and then another did find us on the, the internet on a scholarship database. Um, we are a little unique, actually a lot unique because in addition to, you know, it's kind of a partnership with us we require that each scholarship applicant has a community partner um, that they work with. We call them sponsors, and we prefer that it's an advocate or someone who works at a nonprofit organization, particularly that has some expertise or knowledge of intimate partner abuse. Um, and so those organizations, that network of organizations, maybe two or 300 over the, around the country, also will connect clients, you know, if someone comes in and this person says they might want to go to school, they know that eventually they could refer to WISP. One of the other things that uh, appealed to me, and, and I can see how it is a 
positive effect in a lot of these stories is that there aren't a lot of restrictions on what you can use the money for. You use it to move yourself forward and um, it, it's not, it, it seems to me anyway, that it's not weighed down in so much red tape that people have to worry about accounting for every penny or, um, and I just thought that, that that plays out beautifully in so many of the stories that people are able to use the money to help move themselves and their family forward mm -hmm. without a whole bunch of uh, red tape. Yeah, we are so lucky that we don't have a lot of red tape that we have to, you know, like a government grant or program often has tons of stipulations and we have a few, we have to answer to the IRS. So there are certain things we need, um, you know, certain boundaries but each woman knows best what she needs. Um, and so honoring each person's individual experience is really important. And there are certain barriers that there's not a lot of government assistance available for, or even in the community, um, car repairs, that's a tricky one. Um, childcare is really expensive. Sometimes those vouchers don't cover everything or in the book, Alicia's story, she talks about her need was for childcare, but what that looked like was keeping her daughter in this private school because they had before school care and they had after school care. And so she did not have to drive two hours home to get her daughter from school to daycare or rely on a bus or someone else. Um, her daughter could go in at seven o'clock in the morning and she could pick her up at five. And it offered um, some consistency and continuity for her daughter during this tumultuous time when, you know, this stuff was happening at home. So, you know, some people might look sideways at private school tuition. Um, but for her, this was the fit. And we could say that's child care. Absolutely. You can use the money for that. Excellent. Well, so if you think about what we've talked about so far, there's so many wonderful stories in the book. What's an aspect that we haven't touched on yet that you want to make sure people know about this work or these people that you're helping? Well, I think hmm, if we're talking about intimate partner abuse, there's a couple of things I would say. And first is that um, I think a lot of times when people think about it, they only think of the physical aspect of intimate partner abuse. And that, that's one type, but there is a lot of other types that we also take into consideration and people should know about because um, they might even be experiencing it and not know. So emotional abuse, financial, sexual abuse, and sp spiritual abuse, it really comes down to this idea of power and control, one person exerting power and control over another. Um, and I think it's an education to read the book because each person, like I think they, the, whole, the stories cover the whole spectrum of that. And then the other one would be that, um, you know, it, it can happen to anyone in any socioeconomic economic status. You know, it's not just poor people or it's not just those people. Um, it's certainly not just stupid people. It's, exactly. It's very any, smart. You know, very yeah, intelligent, very, smart. very competent people. <clears throat> yeah, because it can be very sneaky and insidious and hard to recognize. Um, so to kind of dispel the idea that you know, it only happens to certain types of people is important. Um, and then I guess I would also mention in my work, we talk about um, men as the perpetrator most of the time and women as the victim. Um, but it is important to know that this can happen in same sex relationships too. Um, certainly men can be victimized. Um, the reason we focus only on women for this scholarship and for the purpose of helping her get an education that would lead to employment 
um, is that women have less economic opportunity than men um, currently. And so that's where our focus lies. But that's that's not to say that that's the only type of abuse that ever happens. We certainly recognize that the whole spectrum and that there are services for people who fall outside of um, our scholarship parameters. Um, you know, so if someone has this going on, if they feel like they're in an abusive relationship that, you know, the National Domestic Violence Hotline is for anyone. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I've, as you're saying that, I remember one of the last people I worked with, um, it was a few years ago now, but he came in and was, um, He wanted me to help change him so that he would stop doing the things that, quote, made his wife beat him, close oh. quotes. And all I had to offer him was the observation that no one's making her beat you <laughs> and that, that I can't I can't do what you're asking me to do because you're not causing her to perpetrate this violence on you. And unless you, you know, come to that realization, then you can't, you know, hold her accountable and or make the changes you need to make to get out of it. But it does definitely happen in all directions. It's it's far more common for men to be physically, verbally, and emotionally abusive to women. And it is not just one way. It also happens the other way. Fortunately in in smaller numbers, but it's it's a real thing it is a real thing yeah and i i definitely recognize that there's barriers for men you know getting help um if they're being abused um different from barriers for women needing the biggest help. one is being able to admit it i mean it's exactly. hard enough for women to admit it yeah it's just even more intensely difficult for a man to admit that definitely yeah no question. And, and I think, you know, in same sex relationships, that was a learning curve for me. Um, and, and in hindsight, you know, looking at it and thinking, well, of course, you know, it, you know, it's not so much gender. It is mo it is the power and control cycle, but I will venture to say that in our current, um, social climate, you know, the, the patriarchy view of men being dominant, um, is probably why I see, you know, more men's violence against women. That's something that Jackson Katz, he's a, he's written several books. He works in this field too. And he's, he specifically says men's violence against women to point out like who is perpetrating, um, you know, and, and call out that, that particular person. So, and we could, we could go down that rabbit hole and analyze it and pick it apart. But I, I think that, um, you know, those points that I made, those general points, hopefully get people thinking about maybe a little differently about what their view is of an abused woman or a victim of domestic violence. Think a little more broadly. And if, if they are <clears throat> being maltreated in a relationship that they consider Seeking yeah, there's there's real good stuff out there, especially over the past years when the internet's taken off. TED talks from people who were um, really intelligent and competent, but they're willing to get on stage and say, "Yeah, I was I was in a pattern that was severely abusive to me." And so, um, it's great to be able to have resources like Wisp to offer people. Yeah. Um, so as we get near the end of our time here, what would you offer people if they wanted to reach out to you or the WISP? What's the best way for them to connect? Well, I think email is probably the best and they could certainly start with me. And if I'm not the right person to talk to them, uh, they can, I'll, I'll direct them. I used to be a case manager. So if I don't know the answer, I will either find it or find the person who does. Um, and that email is, it's easy, jill at wispinc.org. And if there's notes or whatever, you can put that in there. And then on our website too, 
um, which is wispinc.org, uh, there are links to each person. So, um, you know, if somebody thinks they would like to apply and they see in the contact page, you know, they can click the scholarship coordinator for their particular state and be connected directly with that person. And the website's a great resource, um, obviously tons of information about our program, but we do also try to provide other information, mostly geared towards school, you know, um, other scholarship searches or, or places where they might get some aid for, for school. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's a delightful book. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for the work you're doing and uh, for being willing to share this time with us. I appreciate it. Thank you for reading and for sharing my message. You're very welcome and deserving. Blessings. Since 2003, Jill Tremlett Large has worked with participants in the Women's Independence Scholarship Program, WISP for short. For 25 years, WISP has provided financial support in the form of college scholarships to women who are survivors of intimate partner abuse. The book, Where the Light Gets In, is a collection of stories from program participants about the gift that they received from WISP and about the infinite positive ripple effect of that one action. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.